Welcome to Scary Stories for a Rainy Night, Volume 35. This is a special edition, and tonight I am joined by an exclusive guest. Tonight we will be doing things a bit different. My guest will read you three incredibly creepy true stories first, and then I will read twelve more. Are you ready? Everybody, please help me welcome Graveyard Girl. Awesome to be here being scared. I brought my umbrella. <laughs> now that's the spirit. I lived alone when this happened. I was getting ready for bed one night, and I was pretty sure I heard my front door close while I was brushing my teeth. This spooked me, and when I went to go check, the front door was closed and locked. But just to be safe, I checked my house and thankfully didn't find any unwanted visitors. I crawled into bed that night and fell asleep rather quickly. I dreamt I was in a waiting room. There were people all around me reading magazines or on their phone, but nobody was talking. As a matter of fact, I remember it being completely silent. All of a sudden, an old woman sitting right next to me grabbed my arm. I turned and looked right into her face, and she had the most terrified and disturbing look on her face. A face of pure dread. She said, wake up, there is someone in your house. I woke up instantly and was almost hyperventilating. I felt as if someone was in my room watching me but I looked around and didn't see anyone. The dream had scared me so much that I felt compelled to check my house again. Once again, I found nobody. I eventually went back to bed and nothing else happened, but I will never forget the woman's face when she told me that and the feeling of terror I had when I woke up. For a few minutes, I was positive that the woman was telling me the truth and that there was someone in my house that night. Part of me still believes that there was someone, and I just didn't find them. I work as the janitor at a local high school. I would 95% of the time be the only one working the night shift. There really wasn't need for more than one. I always start with the downstairs classrooms and then work my way to the upstairs. The cafeteria, gym, auditorium, and nurse's office, those were all the responsibility of the morning and afternoon guys. So since I was always working alone, I would usually have radios set up in the hallways, playing loud music, like I did on this one specific night. The upstairs of the school was shaped like a U rather than an O, so to go around to the other side, there was only one way. I was mopping the floor in one of the classrooms when I noticed from all the way across the other side of the school, the lights to one of the classrooms turned on. The light wasn't left on. I always shut the lights off to any room that I'm not cleaning. I stood there with chills running through my body. I saw someone walking over to the window. They stopped and stared straight over at me through the window. It was one of the most disturbing things that I had ever seen, and I didn't know what to do. Run away? Confront them? Call the police? I got closer to the window and saw the person look to be in their 30s or 40s. He raised his hand and began waving at me slowly. I pulled the curtains to the classroom shut and I tried to catch my breath. When I pulled the curtains open slightly to look again, the light that was in that classroom across the school was now off and my heart began to pound. I was sure he was on his way over to this classroom. At that moment, the option to run seemed best, and so I did. I ran down the hallway and down the stairs to the back door of the school. I didn't care about anything in that moment except my life. 
the security cameras in the school revealed that at some time in the middle of the night, the man emerged from the school basement and started wandering around. I got a closer look at the man's face when watching the camera footage, and it was disturbing. He was not a normal looking man. The scariest part was watching him eventually go back down into the basement and then never seeing him come back out. He was never found. I still don't know exactly what happened or why. It took place a few years ago in 2013. I was home alone. Although my parents went out often and I usually stayed home by myself and played video games, I never really felt alone. My friend Thomas lived right next door and if you looked out my bedroom window, which was on the second floor, you could see right into his. It was awesome. We played video games together online most of the time and the night that this happened was no different. It was Saturday and with my parents gone, I planned to play video games all night. We were in the middle of a match when Thomas told me he would be right back. That was normal, of course, but after 10 minutes, I stood up and looked out my window. Right then, I saw him walk back into his bedroom and put his headset back on. I asked him what took so long, and he said he thought he heard his back door open and close. I asked if his parents were home, and he said no, that he was home alone too. We went back to kicking some ass when about 30 minutes later, I heard something downstairs in my house. It was really late at this time and Thomas said he was going to bed. I turned off my console too and walked out of my bedroom to go downstairs. I stopped halfway down the stairs. I could see the faint shadow of someone sitting in the chair in the living room. They were facing away from me and I was about to speak out, but then I realized it wasn't my mom or my dad. I went back up the stairs as slowly and silently as I possibly could, never taking my eyes off the person. When I reached the top, I silently moved back into my bedroom a few feet away. I grabbed my cell phone and hit the green messaging icon on the screen. At that moment, I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. Completely terrified, I didn't know what to do. I got in my bed and pulled the covers up over my head, hoping and praying whoever it was would think nobody was home. I tried to lay as flat and still as possible and control my breathing. I heard nothing after that. I stayed under the covers without moving for a long time. I felt like someone was watching me. I eventually pulled my cell phone up and texted my parents. I didn't get the immediate response that I wanted, so I decided to text Thomas. I typed one word, and then I heard the hard wood floor in my bedroom creak. I froze. You have no idea how bad I wanted to look and see if someone was standing in my bedroom, but at the same time, too terrified to do it. I ended up laying there under the covers for at least an hour before finally getting a text. I was scared to move, but a minute later, I opened it. It was from Thomas. I felt all the blood rush out of my face and I started to shake. The text read, who is in your bedroom? I ripped the covers off of my head out of pure adrenaline and fear and there was nobody there. This is a recounting of a terrifying incident that three of my friends experienced during the summer after our junior year in high school. I very nearly became a part of the tale myself, but a scheduled shift at the movie theater saved me. They showed up at my house earlier that day, asking if I wanted to go with them into the woods to explore an area that we had yet to search. But I had to work later that evening, so I had to decline. It's been over 25 years since this occurred, therefore not all that happened can be remembered. But I will do my best. Looking back now at the way life was then, I can positively say, things have changed greatly for kids. 
My neighborhood was its own self-contained city on the edge of the city limits. At the end of the 60s, some idealistic developer got the crazy idea to buy up hundreds of rolling acres of prairie and forest land out in the middle of nowhere. He created a little suburban sprawl for the coming rise of manufacturing and the people needed to fill those jobs. The factories did come, Johnson & Johnson, Folgers Coffee, places such as that, but within 30 years, they would begin to leave just as quickly. The children of these factory workers found themselves separated from their peers in the rest of the city, and with nothing better to do, took to the woods surrounding them to explore and discover nature, much as their distant ancestors who settled this land hundreds of years before. I was one of these children, and so were my three friends, who would make the discovery on one of these journeys into the woods. Without me along, they took to the fields opposite the new highway. These stretched for miles back then, and during this summer, were laying fallow. Our part of Texas rides the line between prairie land and forest. You may find yourself walking for miles on open land, only to discover acres upon acres of woods between the next field. After walking for miles across nothing, they came upon a forested area most of us had yet to explore. A path led to an abandoned barn. When they turned the corner to look inside of it, they came face to face with the corpse of a hanged man. From what I was told later, not one of them believed it to be real. However, as they got closer, there was no longer any doubt. The body was that of a trucker who had parked his 18-wheeler at the nearby truck stop around Christmas. He walked the three or so miles into the woods and ended his life. To this day, no one knows if he knew that the barn was there or it just happened upon it. But we do know on that hot, humid summer day, his bloated body posed a horrific sight. Realizing someone was likely missing him, my friends returned to the very same truck stop he had walked away from the year before and called the cops. Of course, I didn't hear all about this until the next day. Even though it did sound like an amazing adventure, I'm thankful that I had to sit it out. All three of them went on to differing levels of legal and emotional troubles, including battles with drug addiction. The only one left living, Stephen, has spent several stints in and out of institutions, and the last time we spoke, little of my childhood friend remained. I can't claim that the discovery of the trucker's body was the only thing for their eventual decline, but it most certainly contributed to it. We wanted to have a good time together, my girlfriend and I. You see, she's a nurse and has to work the night shift. The hospital she works at requires about five years of experience before you can even think of working on day shift. This wouldn't be such a problem, but I work as a marketer. I have a typical nine to five in an office, and it's really tough finding time for each other. Our sleep schedules are chaotic to say the least. So when Valentine's Day rolled around on a day and night that we were both working, we got really frustrated. It's really hard to explain how you feel like you're being cheated out of time, like there isn't going to be a moment you can sit down and truly enjoy your relationship for what it is. But we decided that we weren't going to let our lame schedules get the best of us. We decided that we would visit a city for a weekend away. Valentine's Day fell on a Thursday, but we figured having a little trip that weekend would be the next best thing. Maybe even better. She's been really adamant about visiting Oak Ridge in Tennessee. Her grandfather worked there back in the day, and it's always been of interest to her. She's always telling me these facts about how creepy it is and how she just has to go one day. It's roughly an eight-hour drive from where we live, so we made a deal about driving. I was going to drive the entire way there, and she was going to drive while we were actually in the city. She totally got the good deal of the bargain, but that's just what you do when you care for your girlfriend. But something strange happened. 
something that has tainted my memory ever since that time. When I think back and remember that weekend away, I'm not thinking about us cuddling up on the couch, or any of the fun places we got to visit there either. We got there Friday night. She mostly slept in the car, but still felt really tired. She told me that she'd be able to sleep that night that we got there, and be awake and normal for the next day. So that's just what we did, and it was a really great day. We got to visit one museum and learn about the Manhattan Project. Even got to visit the plant where her grandfather used to work. At least we were pretty sure. He's deceased now. But the tour guide said that this was where the majority of the work on the bombs was done. And well, he worked on them. Anyway, the day was great, but it didn't last very long. By the time it was dark, we were out of ideas for things to do, and quite frankly, out of energy. We decided to visit our favorite fast food joint, Wendy's. Don't judge us. She was driving as we made our way there. It was only about a 10 or 15 minute drive. She had her music on and I was just kind of looking out the window. At one point, a blue Mustang was beside our car. We were stopped at a red light and I looked out the window and peered into theirs. I saw a very old man. He looked unhappy, miserable even. His skin looked unnaturally pale. I'm not sure when he started, but he was staring at me. It wasn't until I looked into the car that I noticed it either. Not going to lie, it kind of freaked me out. We made eye contact for about five seconds, and then for the briefest of moments, he smiled. But it was so fast, it must have been a split second that his mouth went into smile and then back to a frown. It was the strangest and scariest thing that I've ever seen. I looked over at my girlfriend and she hadn't noticed at all. She was jamming out to Bohemian Rhapsody. The light turned green and we were in motion again. I didn't take my eyes off that car for the rest of that ride. At least, until they turned. That's not the craziest part. You see, it gets even weirder. We were planning on leaving Monday morning, and on Sunday night we went out to eat, but this time to an actual restaurant. We weren't feeling fast food again. We looked on Google and found a local restaurant that had pretty decent reviews. It had my favorite food, deep fried chicken. So off we went. I had completely forgotten about the strange man that I saw in that car, but about halfway through my meal, I noticed him again. This time, he was in the restaurant, staring at me. I know he was, and when I noticed, he made the exact same facial movement, just the way I remembered. He went from a miserable frown, and into a split second, he was smiling only for his face to be frowning again in just the next instant. I'm not sure my reaction was warranted. He hadn't actually done anything wrong to me, and I was enjoying a nice meal with my girlfriend, which is why it was so strange for my fight or flight to kick in, and I went up and confronted him. He was sitting at a booth alone. I asked him why he was looking at me. To my absolute surprise, he never said a word. He just sat there and frowned at me. I asked him what his problem was before my girlfriend told me it was time that we needed to leave. She knows that I can get a little worked up and wanted to avoid a confrontation. It's not illegal to look at people, she said. Still though, there was something about that man that made me feel so strange, so threatened, so watched. Well, Monday morning came. We were about an hour into the car ride home and she was asleep again. And you guessed it. You totally guessed it. I saw this freaky ass old man again. But this time it was way worse. For starters, he was driving a totally different car. I don't know what this guy's life is like, but I can just imagine what you have to do to be able to afford a Mustang and still have enough money to have a second car. And to make matters even worse, he had been in the left lane as if he was going to pass me. But he didn't. He just paced me for about a mile. I noticed that there was a car next to me, 
and it wasn't until I looked over to flip the bird that I recognized him. It was the creepy old man, but he wasn't frowning anymore. That smile that he had only been able to muster for a split second was now permanently stained on his aged face. It was the most horrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. Suddenly, he turns his head forward and aggressively veers his car in my direction. Reflexively, I slam the brakes and swerve off to the side of the road. My girlfriend is shaken awake, and all we can see is his vehicle speeding off in the distance through a cloud of dirt. My heart was racing like crazy, and by the time I could process my girlfriend screaming, asking what the hell was going on, I started to feel myself choke up. We discussed whether we should waste our time calling the police, but I was so scared that the best course of action seemed to be to get out of that godforsaken town as fast as possible. The rest of the ride home happened without incident, and I have never seen him again. Needless to say, that was the least romantic and most insane Valentine's Day ever. When I was 12, I remember one Friday night, and there's no way that I could ever forget it. My older brother and I were picking up snacks and drinks at a little convenience store for a party that we were holding that night. My brother had me wait in the car while he ran inside to get the chips and whatnot. This happened in the 90s, so cell phones were not really a thing yet, especially for a 12-year-old. I remember abruptly looking up and seeing a man's face peering into the window inches from mine. He had glasses on and looked intelligent, but creepy. He smiled, and it was obvious right then that there was something very off about him. I could tell instantly that his intentions were not good. He said hello, and then asked my name. I gave him a false name, and then he said that his name was John. I gave a nervous and forced smile, and it became increasingly awkward. I looked past the man, hoping to see my brother walking over to the car, but I was filled with disappointment. He was still inside the store. The man, or John, as he said his name was, then asked me if I lived nearby. This was such a red flag that I was almost speechless and just replied, not really. He kept a very creepy smile the entire time. I looked over his shoulder again and thankfully saw my brother walking towards the car. Just then, John tried opening the door. Thank the Lord it was locked. I don't remember locking it, but you can bet your ass that I was glad that it somehow was locked. I didn't have time to react and John immediately walked away after the door didn't budge. My brother walked up seconds later and asked who the hell that was. I was shaking and told him that I had no idea. Nothing else happened that night, and the party was great, but in the back of my mind, I couldn't help but think that this guy was trying to kidnap me. However, about two years later, I saw the guy on the news. He was captured and sentenced to death for murdering three teenage boys. Sound unbelievable? Trust me, I have trouble believing it myself. Thirty years later, I still sometimes have nightmares of that bastard. Needless to say, I remind my kids to lock the door all the freaking time. During the early 2000s when I was attending law school, I worked nights delivering pizza for one of the national chains. I had done something similar when I was younger and attending my local community college. Anytime that I found myself sorely in need of quick cash, that was the avenue I would choose. Despite the many stories I have heard questioning the safety of the job, I never had a single run-in with a thief. I'm sure back in the early days it could be a little dangerous, but by the time I joined the game, companies had learned 
that implementing practices such as limiting the driver to $20 lowered the chance of holdups drastically. Even though I was never a victim of a robbery, I did have one or two scary incidents. The worst of these happened to me back in the 2000s. I was very familiar with the city I was living in at the time. Moving there after my junior year in college and delivering for several places over the last five years had made me intimate with almost every nook and cranny of the place. However, one evening, I would be called to an address that I, nor any of the other drivers, even knew existed. When the order came in, I went straight to the map to find the address, but it wasn't there. Not even the GPS on my phone showed it. We didn't have any no-delivery areas at the time, so I had to take it despite my misgivings. Theoretically, the place would have existed if the road continued for ten more blocks, so I turned on to said road a block before its ending and followed it south. Sure enough, a newly paved road began where the old one should have ended. For what seemed like miles, I continued on this new section of road. Nothing stood on either side of it, and I didn't pass another car the whole time. How the state managed to build it without a single report of its creation leaking to the media had me very bewildered. The five years I had been driving all over this city, I had not known this part existed. In one way, I was very excited seeing all of it, like a Victorian explorer tracing the source of the Nile. But at the same time, a deserted road popping up out of nowhere gave me a chill down my spine. It must have been a good ten minutes before the house in question appeared in the distance. I couldn't understand why someone would build a house out here in the middle of nowhere with no way to reach it. When I got closer, I could see the house had to be at least 50 years old or more, and probably hadn't been repaired since then. No cars were around, and for a moment, I thought the house was abandoned. But I could see the front door wide open beyond the rickety old screen. Everything looked to be above board, so I grabbed the pizza and headed for the door. I knocked on the screen door but got no answer. I could see what appeared to be a young female walking around the kitchen. When I knocked a second time, I heard a female voice say to come in. Despite my reservations, I stepped just inside the house and waited in the small foyer. I had learned from other drivers early on not to enter an unfamiliar house, but I had yet to see anything to concern me. I assumed the woman would appear to pay me. Instead, I overheard an unseen man whisper, Call him into the kitchen. When I heard that, I fled from the place as fast as I could. I was so freaked out, I got back to the restaurant in half the time that it took me to get to the house. After I told my boss what had just occurred, he called the police. All the excitement had me rattled, so my boss sent me home for the day. My phone rang a few hours later. It was the police. They had called to let me know what they had found. Whoever had been there was gone now. Even though the place had more than likely been abandoned for a while, they did find evidence that people had just recently been inside. This was stuff that my boss had already told them. However, they did shed light on where the road came from and why the house was the only building on an otherwise deserted area. The state had been trying to purchase the land on which the new section of road and house were for 20 years, but the landowner wouldn't sell. They even tried to use eminent domain to get it, but a judge blocked it. Around two years before, the owner passed, and his children finally sold the land to the state. They were so happy to get the land after all that time, the construction on the road was started immediately. It technically had yet to be formally opened, but locals had already begun using it anyway. This was good to know, but I still wondered how the two people knew about the empty house sitting in the middle of nowhere. We could only assume that they drove past it and decided it would be as good a place as any to ambush a delivery driver. Even $20 is a good score if you're desperate enough. He said from personal experience 
People had killed for much less. The officer left me with one good piece of news, though. The county had slated the old house to be demolished in the coming week, so no other poor delivery driver would be let out there to be robbed, or worse. Two days later, I was driving down the brand new road, which I was now using as a shortcut across town, and witnessed the house's destruction. A load was being lifted from my shoulders right before my eyes. Never again would I enter a customer's home or even deliver to an area in which I was not well versed. During my time in college, I had a friend whose dad owned an 800-acre piece of land in eastern Texas. In the past, he had leased it out to hunters and paper companies, but was no longer doing it. He had built a cabin on the land a few years before, and would let us go out there from time to time and mess around. It served as a great way to relax from the pressures of school and to get closer to nature. The spring break of 1997, we loaded up our trucks and headed for the cabin. Our plans were to shoot guns, drink beer, and other things rednecks like us do in the woods. Our first morning kept us busy cleaning the cabin and moving all our stuff inside. Around dinner, we made a big fire outside and cooked a bunch of steaks and fried potatoes. We skipped dessert and broke open some beers instead. The sun went down and not long after for the remainder of the evening, we got loaded and passed around a joint or two. At some point in the night, I heard a shuffling noise outside and went out to check on it. The fire was barely burning at that point, and just outside of its light, I swore I could see the shape of a man standing completely still. From what I could tell, he was facing me, perhaps waiting to see what I would do. I blinked my eyes really hard to get a clearer look, but my position and the lack of light made it too hard to see clearly. The shape continued to stand still, so I decided I'd walk up a little closer in hopes of getting a better picture. The thought terrified me, but I was transfixed by the being, or perhaps I was still too intoxicated to make wise decisions. I took two steps forward, but was distracted by a voice behind me. My friend had woken up and noticed the door was wide open. So, he got out of bed and saw me walking around the fire. His voice caused me to jump a little, but I soon realized who it was speaking. I asked him if he saw the figure on the other side of the fire pit. He just laughed at me and said that I must be so stoned I was seeing things. We laughed it off and returned to bed. On my way, I turned back to take one more look but the shape was no longer there. I chuckled to myself and went back to sleep. The next morning, I wrote the whole experience off as the result of too much fun and went on with my day. We spent the first half of it fishing at the big pond. Post-lunch was shooting guns and one guy's compound bow that he had just bought. The beers and smoke were broken out after dinner. A game of poker was attempted but soon cancelled in favor of another evening, telling lies around the fire. On one of my many trips to relieve myself that night, I was spooked by the sound of a stick breaking close by and returned to the fire very quickly. The look of fear on my face made the other guys laugh their butts off. I tried to explain what had happened but was quickly reminded that we weren't the only creatures in the woods. The reasoning seemed sound, so I accepted it. Not long after, we were standing around, involved in some deep discussion, and I turned to speak to the guy on my left. What I saw caused me to clench up so tight I could have snapped a steel rod with my sphincter. Standing within a few steps behind my friend was another man that I did not recognize. It was like he appeared out of nowhere. What made it creepier was that he was staring intently at the back of his head, almost like he was trying to bore through it with his eyes. I remained frozen stiff. The longer I looked at him, I realized he was the same being I saw lingering outside 
the night before. He was average height with a long, unkempt beard. My friend continued rambling about whatever, unaware of his presence. After several long seconds, the stranger turned to me with a blank expression and walked away. This was when my friend finally noticed my horrified look. When he spoke, the thrall of fear was released, and I began pointing and rambling about what I had just witnessed. He and my other friend laughed at me again. There was no way I was seeing things this time. I described the man, and one of them suggested that it was Bigfoot. Despite my protest, no one was buying it, and I eventually cut my losses and shut up. However, I wasn't beat. Their mockery had made me even more determined to prove the stranger's existence. The next two days were quiet, no stranger, but I kept my eyes peeled for anything out of the ordinary. By our fifth morning, I was beginning to question my sanity. I had seen this mysterious being stalking around us twice, and now it had suddenly disappeared. I resolved to put my quest on the back burner until some new evidence arose. My friend's dad had mentioned to him an owner of one of the surrounding properties had spotted a small group of wild hogs running through his land, so we grabbed our rifles and went on the search for them. One mile or so down one of the property's many roads, we came across some hog wallows and knew that we were on the scent. We went up the road now on foot tracking them. Another mile on, we stumbled upon three large hogs rooting up the ground and prepared to make bacon. Two of us chambered around as quiet as possible on our rifles and took aim. I was less than a second from saying three and pulling the trigger when the loud crack of another rifle filled the air, followed closely by a burst of wood and bark above my friend's head. It took a moment for it to register that we were being shot at. A few seconds later, another crack and strike, this time even closer to my friend. We weren't going to wait for a third. The friend who appeared to be the target led us down a side trail that led back to the cabin. No more shots followed as we fled. However, instead of finding safety at the camp, the shots began again. Seeing no other option, we hopped into my truck and hauled ass out of there. This was a time just before the commonality of cell phones, so we had to drive 20 miles to town to get help. After we explained the situation, we returned to the property a few hours later with some deputies. We approached slowly and remained in the cars when we parked. We waited to see if the shots would start again, but nothing happened. A cursory look around counted three holes in the cabin and another two in my buddy's windshield. Perhaps the worst part was that all of our camping stuff, sleeping bags and such, were spread out all over the ground. Luckily, we had smoked all the weed the night before. Nothing was missing except a box of ammo and, strangely, my sleeping bag and wool blanket. A theory began to form in the deputies' minds that we had stumbled upon a squatter or poacher camping out on the property for whatever reason. They acted as if they were going to let it go, but once my friend's dad who owned the land heard about it, he put pressure on them to start a search. This was about the time I repeated my story of seeing someone lurking around the cabin. No one was laughing now and my story was finally being taken seriously by someone. The search was led around the property by my friend's dad. School had already begun again by the time it took place. It continued for a full week, but nothing other than a few old camps were found. It was assumed that he knew the heat would be on him after the shooting incident, and he moved on. During the course of the investigation, several avenues were followed to ID the stranger like escaped cons, but he remains unidentified to this day. Because of the chance of another attack, our trips to the property ended. The next year we tried to camp out somewhere else, but it wasn't the same, and our nature getaways died out. 
Within five years, my friend's dad had a heart attack and lost interest in the cabin. The paper company's lease was renewed and the land's trees have been used to make paper and pulp wood products ever since. Each time I jot down a quick note, I'm reminded of our awesome trips and especially the odd and terrifying week that caused them to stop. I do, once or twice a year, talk to my old college friend on the phone. As far as he has heard, that crazy stranger still has not been caught. We sometimes theorize as to his origins and where he may have ended up. I, however, often take this much farther when I'm alone. I wonder why our so-called stranger seemed to focus so much of his anger onto my friend, and perhaps, far more concerning, is he still out there waiting for his chance to finish what he began all those years ago. Although what I'm about to tell you may sound like one of your run-of-the-mill horror stories, I swear by the validity of it and what I saw. It all started on a very hot July day this past year. My car is almost 20 years old and sometimes overheats on hot days, just like this one. However, until I get a better paying job, it's the car that I'm stuck with. This day... I was driving through the back roads looking for a family of dog breeders a friend had told me about. I had been searching for the place for several hours and was approaching the warmest part of the day. As per usual, my car began overheating and I was forced to pull over. I picked up my phone to call my girlfriend, only to see that my battery was dead. After I spent a couple of minutes cussing my luck, I acknowledged that I was going to have to find someone with a working phone. That wasn't going to happen unless I started walking. Soon, I spotted an old farmhouse off in the distance and started heading towards it. A trip that would have taken half an hour on a normal day took almost an hour because of the oppressive heat. I had to take several breaks during the course of the journey, but eventually made it. The area around the house looked more like a junkyard. Parts of old cars spread about and I had to weave through a maze of them to reach the front door of the house. I knocked on the door for several minutes but got no answer. Thinking maybe that the homeowner may be hard of hearing, I walked around and looked into the windows hoping to see someone inside. At the side of the house, I spotted a telephone hanging on the wall just inside the kitchen. Now that I knew that there was a phone there, I became excited and started calling out for someone, anyone. Even after walking all the way around, no reply came. I was about to give up until I saw a woman laying on a bed. I very nearly banged on the window to try to get her attention, but I figured that may scare her, so I went back to the front door and let myself in. In hindsight, that was just as scary. Before I entered, however, I took a piece of paper from a notebook that I carry with me and wrote out a note explaining what I was doing there. Even then, I called out several times as I approached the bedroom. Still no answer came, and I continued toward the room. The closer I got to the woman, the more her appearance began to unnerve me. She was laying flat on her back and staring blankly at the ceiling. I had initially believed that she was watching the television that was turned on in the room with her, but her eyes sat completely still. Regardless, I got closer and once I was within a few steps, handed her the note. When the note touched her hand, she didn't react. This caused me to get closer, and this is when I realized something was very wrong. Her face had a very dry, almost mummified look to it. Her hair was a vibrant black, a color not often seen on older females. She had to have known I was there by that point, but her eyes stayed fixed. This was what caused me to lean in even closer and look right into her eyes. Rather than being slightly bloodshot or moist looking like most people's, they had a shiny, glassy appearance, 
like they were fake. In spite of this, not until I actually touched her did I know for sure that she was dead. I realized that perhaps she was a mannequin rather than a human, so I reached down to touch her bare hand. The texture of her skin was dry, but stone cold to the touch. The oddity of this was just beginning to really sink in when a loud creaking noise came from behind me. Without a second thought, I tore out of there and ran back down the road in the direction of my car. Within half of a mile, I ran into an older man in a truck, and he agreed to give me a ride back into town. I said nothing about my experience to him, and any time he attempted to make small talk, I said as little as I could. He let me borrow his phone to call my girlfriend, and she agreed to meet us at a gas station on the edge of town. When he let me out there, I thanked him, and he went on his way. Once I was safely inside my girlfriend's car, I borrowed her phone to call the police. I hadn't even told her about it yet, so the look of shock on her face as I described what I saw showed me what my expression likely was at the time I discovered it. The cops said that they would send a car out to the house to check out my claims. I called a wrecker next to pick up my car. The police never called me back, so after waiting three days, I called to inquire about what they found. It took a few minutes to find a person aware of my call, but once I did, the officer said that he and his partner searched the entire property and found nothing out of the ordinary, especially not a mummified woman. I thanked them and hung up. What happened after I fled? I can only guess. The noise behind me was probably the owner of the home, and he had hid the woman's body, knowing that the cops were likely to be called. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure what I saw in that house. On that bed, I am positive that I saw a human laying on that bed. But that's all. More than once, I've been tempted to grab a camera and return to that house to get proof of my claims. But fear of the unknown, and what else could be waiting for me if I did, stopped me. If the nightmares of her soulless eyes continue, however... I may have no other choice. This is actually the youngest scary encounter that I can remember. At the time, I must have been around five years old and at Chuck E. Cheese. For those that don't know, Chuck E. Cheese is a kid's play area and pizzeria with games like skee-ball small rides, ball pits, picture booths, and at the time, a large extended area of colorful tubes that you could climb up to and around. I haven't been in any years now, but the last that I saw the tubes had gotten dramatically shorter or were gone altogether. My story is probably one of the many reasons that this change occurred. As you can imagine, the tubes are designed for kids and a person stood at the entrance and exit of Chuck E. Cheese, so it felt safe, and most parents would sit at the tables and let their kids run around, doing whatever they wanted. I was playing hide-and-seek with Cass when it was my turn to hide. There were plenty of places to hide, but the tubes offered a lot of cover, and I felt like I'd be able to hear her coming and could always slide down the slide and run to avoid being detected. So I climbed up the left and right mats until I got to the top. I was scurrying and ducking from the little occasional windows on the side as stealthily as I could. And to my five-year-old self, these tubes stretched on forever, offering tons of hiding places. I had been weaving in and out of tubes for a few minutes when I suddenly smelled something very gross. Of course the tubes are stuffy and hot, and rarely smelled anywhere close to pleasant, so that wasn't surprising, but this was different. Whatever the smell was had to be close to me, and it was suffocating. I hear movement and a giggle, and freeze. I know it's not Cass, so I assume it's just some stinky kid messing with me. I don't want to backtrack because I don't want to directly run into Cass if she entered the tubes, so I hold my breath and make a left, 
when I see someone crunched up into a little nook on the side of the tube that doesn't lead anywhere. The path continues down and turns to the right, so I decide to scurry by the stranger and take that path. The smell is the worst here, so I know it's the person in the nook. The giggle comes again, so I decide to keep my head down and just hurry past. I keep my head down and am almost past when I suddenly feel a hand grip and tug on my leg. It's only then that I turn and complete confusion overcomes me. It's a very dirty looking skinny old man with disheveled gray curly hair. He's still holding my ankle and with his other hand brings up and covers his mouth as he giggles again, like a child. I rip my ankle away, and rather than being scared, I tell the man, I thought adults weren't supposed to be up here, like the goody two-shoes that I am. He just smiles, revealing a smile with more spaces than teeth. I just like having fun too. I'm hiding from my daughter. She looks just like you. I'm not sure what to say at this point. I know adults aren't allowed up there because when Cass and I had begged my dad to go in the tubes, he had refused and told us that adults were not allowed. I repeat this to the old man, and ignoring me, he asks, Will you help me find her? She's up here too. And that truly puzzles me. I had passed a little boy when I first entered, but hadn't seen any other kids since. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm hiding from my twin, and I'm sure she's going to find me soon if I don't keep going. His eyes widen, but then he slowly nods his head like he fully understands. I see. Well, maybe I could go with you and we'll find her that way. And to this, I'm already shaking my head. I'm sorry, mister, but you smell. If you follow me, Cass will definitely find us. And he lets out a very wheezy laugh with that. I quickly say goodbye and begin crawling away when I look over my shoulder and see that he is following me. I snap another no at him, already concerned that this delay will leave Cass to find me any moment. I begin scurrying as fast as I can with him following, so I turn my body to face him and begin crab walking away and tell him to knock it off when he reaches for me again. I kick at him with my light up sketcher and continue away. Once I make the turn, I don't see him, but I'm rushing away now, very much creeped out. I can hear his giggle as I move as swiftly as I can in the small tubes, but the tubes were so large to my five-year-old mind that I actually got terribly lost and end up crying for over ten minutes, trying to find a way out or slide to take me down. I finally find a slide to go down as fast as I could. I run over to my parents' table and find Cass sitting there enjoying a slice of pizza. Apparently she had given up finding me when our pizza came out. I am so angry at Cass at that moment that I just cry, telling my parents that I got lost in the tubes and I was scared. It's only when I calm down and am enjoying a slice of pizza when the man pops back into my mind and I feel the need to tell my dad that there was an old man in the tubes. An older boy? He asks, and I shake my head. No, he was an adult, and he smelled really bad. To that, my sister laughs, and my parents exchange weird looks. After we are done eating, my dad says we are going to leave, to which Cass and I begin bawling that we don't want to leave yet and we walk up to the counter to cash in our tickets and pick out our prizes, and though I didn't notice at the time, my dad goes and talks to the manager while Cass and I decide how to split the tickets for the little toys that we want. And we left, just like that. I have no idea if they found the man or what happened, but when I remembered this and brought this up to my dad, he seemed uncomfortable and shrugged it off simply saying that we went to Chuck E. Cheese a lot when we lived in California and that he didn't remember what I was talking about. I have no idea how the man would have gotten in. You have a black light stamp to get in when you entered and get it checked when you were leaving. It still creeps me out when I think about it today.
Not many strange things happen to me. I am fascinated with sleep and dreams, and how each affect our minds. However, what I experienced was not a dream. I don't exactly know what it was. This story isn't filled with any action or anything like that. It's just a mysterious occurrence that I don't know how to explain. I have a really bad sleep schedule. I'm usually wide awake at night and more tired during the day. It was about 1 p.m. I was in my bed getting a bit drowsy. I was trying to battle falling asleep. I don't really know how to describe what happened next, but the video I was watching suddenly stopped emitting sound. I was really confused but didn't seek to do anything about it, so I decided to get up and get some food. I was walking downstairs, got food, and ate it. I ate food. You may think that this has no importance, but it will soon make sense why this is notable. I felt myself eating and swallowing food. I then went upstairs and went to the bathroom. Again, I felt myself go to the bathroom. I felt it leaving my body. Of course, in a normal story, details like this do not matter. However, in this story, it does. I finally returned to my bed to browse on my phone, still not emitting sound. I'm on Instagram, looking at a few posts. This will be important later on. I finally put my phone down, and just start thinking about random thoughts. Nothing important. It felt like 40 or 50 minutes of just... thoughts. Suddenly, like a flash, I was under my blanket. My phone continued playing where the video left off, now emitting sounds. I was almost paralyzed with fear. What the hell just happened? I was back where I was, still 1 p.m. It felt like an entire hour had passed, but my clock had not moved a minute. This is where me eating and going to the bathroom come into play. I swear I ate. I swear I walked downstairs. I swear I felt every step push against me. I felt the food being eaten and swallowed. I felt everything. I know I did. I remember going back up the stairs. I felt that. I felt myself going to the bathroom. It felt the same as when I normally do it. There was no difference. What the hell happened? I felt the comfort of my bed. I remember myself thinking, if it was a dream, time would have passed and I wouldn't have felt anything. It wasn't a lucid dream because, again, time would have passed and I don't think I would have felt anything. I also have never had a lucid dream in my life. I lived out an entire hour of my life that never existed. I went downstairs to see if the snack I had was still there. We only had one of those snacks that I had left, so if I did actually eat it in the real world, it would be gone. I opened the pantry and, believe it or not, the snack was still there. I did not eat it. I felt myself eat it. How could that be possible? I felt every bite, every time I swallowed. I felt it all. There was no way that I didn't eat that snack. Of course, I couldn't prove it. I couldn't prove if I went to the bathroom or not. In that vision, I flushed. So if I did actually go to the bathroom in real life, I couldn't see it. I assumed that I didn't actually go to the bathroom in the real world and that I didn't eat in the real world. However, there was still one thing left. The posts that I had saw on Instagram. I checked Instagram, mostly to calm my nerve. However, this just made the entire situation more creepy. I was browsing Instagram, and I recognized every single post that I saw. They were all in the same order, and the same post as I saw in my vision. There was not a way in any hell that my brain could have made up those actual Instagram posts. There is no way at all. I don't know how that happened. I have no other choice but to believe I traveled to another dimension. I actually believe that. I am not a superstitious person or religious. Never in my life have I ever felt that I am cursed 
or that other dimensions even exist, but this is the only conclusion that I can come up with. You may think I was sleepwalking the entire time, but that just doesn't make sense. I have no history of sleepwalking, and it was too real to be a figment of my imagination. All I'm saying, sleepwalking is ruled out. It was all too real. Of course it wasn't a dream, or a lucid dream. I have some theories onto why I think I traveled to another dimension. The reason I felt all of those things was because I actually did them in another dimension. I guess I somehow teleported to another dimension. I guess in that dimension phones don't emit noise. I went downstairs in that dimension. I ate. I went to the bathroom. I browsed Instagram and laid on my bed to think. All of that actually happened in that dimension. I still remember it happening as memories, as if they were actually real, which I guess they were real in a literal sense. I don't really know what to make of it. Why would a random video teleport me to another dimension? What's the significance of me going there? What was the point? It has no effect on my life besides the constant thinking about it. The real creepy part of this entire incident was the Instagram posts. The exact order of posting. The exact same pictures and videos I saw in my vision. There is no way my brain can make something like that up so accurately. Even if I did have a dream and somehow opened Instagram in real life and saw those posts, I wouldn't have saw it when I awoke. Once you see a post on Instagram, you won't see it again if you close out the app or refresh. I saw the same posts twice, which is basically impossible. Of course, the Instagram posts are not definitive proof that I traveled to another dimension, but they are something. I don't know what else it could be. I have no health problems, I don't do drugs, nothing was wrong with me at that moment. My mental state is fine. I'm not insane or schizophrenic. I don't know what happened. Not many strange things happen in my life, but when they do, they are bad. Some strange things do happen, but those are all stories for another time. I ask for answers or maybe someone to present another theory, possibly a more believable one to tell my friends and family. I am a skeptic for all things paranormal and alien. But this, I just can't explain it. You can't know how it felt unless it was you in my shoes. No one can. I'm from Belfast, Ireland. I have a large friend group and we would always have sleepovers at my house. This is the story of how one campout and my back garden went wrong. I live in a nice neighborhood, mostly with old people in it. It was around Easter, and in my school, we get a week and a half off for Easter break. Just before school ended, we decided to have a campout in my back garden because I recently got a new tent that could fit probably my whole friend group into it. It was the Saturday after we finished, and we all met up at my house around 7 o'clock. We ordered pizza, made marshmallows around the fire, and all in all, we had fun. At around 12.30 a.m., we all decided to crawl into the tent and play some card games, as it was getting quite cold outside. I dealt all 13 decks, and we began a game of Jack Change It!, after around five different card games, we all ordered some food and climbed into bed to wait for the food to arrive. We got a text message saying that it would be there in around 40 minutes, so we all could relax for a while. The food came, and we all went outside to sit around the fire and eat it. I have a large back garden, and we were at the bottom of it, so we weren't afraid of waking my parents up by singing and talking loudly. After finishing our food, we got back into the tent and decided to get some rest. When everyone had drifted off to sleep, I was awoken by a strange sound. A sort of whistling sound. I brushed it off 
as being me dreaming. But around two minutes later, there it was again. Every two minutes, it happened. I woke up my friend and told her to listen. Right after I said that, there was a different kind of whistle, and it came from the other side of the tent. This was when we decided to wake everyone else up. After around ten minutes of listening to the whistling going back and forth, we heard footsteps coming from behind the tent. The crunching of leaves made us all fall still. We counted to three and broke out of the tent sprinting. All of us ran as fast as we could to the back door. Once we were all in, we locked it and looked out the window. We could just barely make out three people standing in the garden looking up at us. I'm not going to lie to you. I am a pretty strange guy. I have always been a loner, and I've always hated people for as long as I can remember, which is why it's ironic that the scariest experience of my life is associated with Valentine's Day. I was working after I graduated high school. I didn't want to go to college, as I was really poor, and I didn't even know what I would want to do if I did go. My plan was to lay low for a little while and figure things out, maybe save up a little money. The gas station I worked at was the kind of place that grossed out visiting truckers. I remember this one time when a trucker stopped in. He saw me looking at my phone while I was waiting for him to get ready to pay for his beef jerky. He gave me a judgmental look and said that I should take some responsibility for how bad this place looked. I didn't have the energy to explain that I wasn't the owner, so I just rang him up and asked if that was all he was going to order. He paid and left without another word. So yeah, it was one of those kinds of places. Anyway, it was Valentine's Day a couple years back. I had volunteered to work the night shift because I made a few dollars more on the hour, which was always nice. Plus, it's normally pretty slow and there isn't much to do. I normally amuse myself by looking at memes on Reddit, but I remember on this particular night, the entire mood was different. I don't know what it was, but I had an ominous foreboding feeling in my heart that night, and I'm not normally the kind of person who buys into the whole paranormal thing. I must have gotten that feeling around 12 AM. I tried brushing it off as best as I could, but I felt oddly on edge. The strange thing was that I had worked plenty of night shifts before. I never had a feeling like this. I was so busy trying to calm myself down and fighting my own fear that I didn't even notice him. A man had come into the gas station. Must have been around 1.15 a.m. I remember his face so vividly. He was so aged looking. His eyes were extremely off-putting. If you gazed into them for long enough, you would inevitably find yourself wondering about the guy's mental state. Suffice to know, he was a creepy guy. He seemed to be in a rush. I remember noticing how swiftly he moved through the aisles, and he instinctually knew exactly what he needed. Didn't have to stop and think even once. Most people do. He came up to the register looking to buy a small gardening shovel duct tape, and a rope. I remember looking down at the items and immediately wondering if this guy was a serial killer or something. That was the exact moment that I got out of my head. I stuttered when I asked him if he wanted anything else. He didn't say a word, just pointed, directly at the cigarettes behind my head. I placed a pack of Marlboro lights on the counter and looked back at the man. He was holding up his hand with two fingers. It took me a second to figure out that he wanted another pack of cigarettes. I rang everything up. I could hear his breathing increasing. It was as if he was annoyed that I wasn't rushing. I tried breaking the tension by making a joke. Got a gardening date tonight, do ya? His facial expression didn't change at all. He made direct eye contact with me and simply shook his head up and down. I told him that his total was $34 even. 
He slapped down two 20s on the table, grabbed his items without a bag, and darted out of the gas station. I went outside to watch him leave. I know I'm not supposed to do that, but I couldn't help myself. I was so curious by this point. What was he buying those things for? Did I just meet a serial killer? All of the wandering thoughts left my head immediately when I saw him slam on the brakes. He turned his truck around and began speeding back to the gas station. My body went into full panic mode. I ran back inside, closed the doors, and locked them. Put the close sign up and called the police. He pulled up outside the gas station and put his truck in park. My heart was pounding in my chest. I screamed at the dispatch the address and then put the phone down on the counter. I mentally made peace with the fact that I was about to die, and I hoped that at least someone could hear me being killed. I heard him start beating on the door trying to get in. The only weapon that I had available was one of those shovels from the random utility aisles. I darted across the gas station and grabbed one, bracing myself. I screamed at him that the police were coming and that he had no chance. I didn't believe the words as they left my mouth. The doors were made of some kind of fiber or plastic material. I think they were even bulletproof, so I knew I was safe for at least a little bit. That was when he stopped pounding on the door. I thought he was going to drive his truck into the gas station to get inside, but thankfully, the thought never struck his mind. He did, however, break one of the windows and throw a lit match inside. After that, he drove off into the night. I put the small fire out and the police got there about 20 minutes after everything happened. One of the cops tried making a joke about this guy's attempt to burn the place down. I was too dazed to hear it. I just remember the guy pity laughing at his own joke before walking back to his police cruiser. I explained to them the entire situation from beginning to end. I still have no clue why he suddenly decided that he wanted to kill me. Perhaps he wanted one less potential witness? Maybe he was just a random psychopath. And as dramatic as that experience may have been, I still get really anxious thinking about the items that he had purchased. I still wonder sometimes, if he had purchased those things to torture someone that he had kidnapped, he was definitely capable. Even if I ever get a girlfriend at some point in the future, Valentine's Day will never be the same. A close friend of my mother's used to live in a fairly large, split-level home with an odd layout. After opening the front door to this abode, one would be confronted with a long set of steps that led to the second floor. The most essential parts of the house were on the second floor, but there were a couple of bedrooms on the ground floor. I had always found this place to be subtly off-putting and quite uncanny. Every time I visited, I found its residual energy hard to shake off, so to speak. The feeling that it left me with would often bleed into the next couple of days. No matter where I was, my surroundings still felt like the house for a little while before the effect wore off. I experienced this sort of thing with most places that I visit, but the aura of this house was particularly strong. When I was about five, my mother and I visited the home. After we were all settled in, and my mom was having an involved and lively conversation with her friend in the kitchen, I had a sudden urge to explore every inch of this strangely configured house. The kitchen and living room were at the top of the initial set of stairs, and everything else was to my right. I followed a long corridor with several dens and bedrooms on either side of it. There was also a large bathroom and a narrow set of stairs that led to the ground level. On the first level, there was a lot of cheap faux wood paneling, two small rooms, and another smaller bathroom. I remained in and around the corridor on the second floor for a while and found seemingly endless things to explore. The house didn't even look that big from the outside and I was baffled at the discrepancy between its interior and exterior. I wandered into one of the dens which was the last room on my left. It had a lot of beautiful natural light and a fully mirrored wall, 
which might have been a closet with sliding mirror doors. Next to the mirror, there was something hanging on the narrow wall that caught my attention. It was a stark white mask. It could have been painted wood, but it also might have been ceramic. Its face was round and had very chubby cheeks. Its tiny mouth was closed and had cherry red lips that smiled slightly. Its eyes were also very tiny and almost shaped. I interpreted the features to be male. The mask seemed notably out of place. The house was unusual, but its decor was typical of suburbia in the mid-1980s. It also had a nautical vibe, because the husband of mom's friend was a sailor. The mask looked like it was teleported straight out of the 15th century China. A more appropriate setting for this artifact would have been a museum, or at least a fancier house. I stood there and stared at it for a long while and gradually became a little lightheaded. I felt inexplicably drawn to its smooth, plump, white face and Mona Lisa smile. At some point, Mom and her friend found me in the mirrored room. One of them asked me what I was doing in there all by myself, took my hand, and led me to the kitchen for a late lunch. In the following years throughout my childhood, I would sometimes think of the mask and fall into a brief trance-like state whenever it entered my mind. Sometimes I would dream of it. Nothing would really happen in these dreams. I would just be standing there, and my surroundings would change. Often I would find myself in my parents' bedroom or wandering the split-level house. The aura of the mask would be present, and I would feel slightly lightheaded as before. Whenever I dreamed of the mask, the feeling of the house and of the mask would be impossible to get rid of the following day or two. Sometimes I found it unsettling as well as mesmerizing, but never figured out why. I can't remember how old I was, but between the ages of 7 and 10 approximately, I would ask my mom if she remembered seeing the mask at the split-level home. I would describe it in detail and my mom would always look puzzled, suggest that I may have seen it at someone else's house, and assume that my memory was faulty. I asked her about it several times periodically throughout my preteen years, and each time, she would have no recollection of me asking about it previously. Without fail, she would suggest that I saw it somewhere else, and that my little five-year-old memory was unreliable. One day I was frustrated, and asked my mom to ask her friend if she ever had a white Asian mask with a chubby face and small red lips in her suburban home in the 80s. The answer was no. No one remembered this mask. When I was younger, about 10 or 11, my best friend, we'll call him Jay, and I both loved making forts outside during our recess time at school. Both of us wanted to spend more time making forts and actually try making them livable, so I invited him to come over because there was a huge forest area about a 10 minute walk from my house. My parents wouldn't be home, but we weren't left totally unsupervised. My brother, who was 16 at the time, was having a bunch of friends over to spend the night, so my parents said that I could have Jay over also to spend the night. It was around 5 o'clock p.m. The sun was still out when I told my brother that Jay and I were going outside to play. He wasn't really listening to me and just said, that's fine, do whatever you guys want. I don't care. We went out the back door and made our way to the woods. It was a fenced off area but there were a couple holes in the fence that we could sneak through. We started walking through the woods, trying to find a nice spot to set up our fort. We brought a backpack with us filled with some food, water, duct tape, and brought our pocket knives. When we finally found a good spot, we started collecting wood and built a nice fort that took a while. The sun was slowly fading away, and we then started working on the interior of the fort. It was a fun time, until I walked out and realized that it was very late. The moon was out, and that's all the light that we had. 
I told Jay, it's probably best that we leave now. But he said, it's probably only like 8 o'clock, and my brother wouldn't care. Keep in mind we were both only 10 or 11 at the time, and neither of us had a cell phone. I said okay, and we continued to build our fort, and then took a break and started eating, until I heard voices and twigs breaking around us outside. I told him to be quiet. I heard more footsteps, and got worried. I was about to run like hell, till I heard leaves crunch right next to our fort. I covered my mouth to hide my breathing, and Jay did the same. There was no easy entrance into our wooden fort. It was very small, and it was sealed together with duct tape, so no one could get in, unless they were very small like us. We heard some chattering, and then we heard somebody say, Shh. Seconds felt like hours until I looked at Jay, and as I did, his eyes were fixed above us, and he pointed up to the top of the tent. I looked up, and saw two faces looking down through the cracks of the wood, and I screamed. We broke through the fort and we both sprinted away in random directions. We both say now that it sounded like they were right behind us as we ran. We kept running for what felt like hours, but was only about five minutes, until Jay called out. I had no idea where he was, but I followed his voice and eventually caught up with him. Jay pointed in a random direction and said let's go. I didn't have any better ideas, so we walked in that random direction. He claimed that he knew where we were going. We started walking that way, until we saw a light coming from the left of us. It was moving up and down, and I realized that it was a flashlight. Jay and I both ducked behind a large tree and waited. There was a group of people walking around looking for us. After waiting several minutes, the lights disappeared and we didn't hear or see anything. We kept walking and eventually found the fence that we had snuck through earlier. We made it back to my house safely and my brother and his friends didn't even know we were gone. It was around 10.30 when we made it home. I haven't told anybody about this story and as far as I know, Jay hasn't either. I have no idea who those people in the woods were that night, but I will never forget those two faces peering down, looking at us. What would they have done if they had caught us? I have no clue, but I can't imagine that it was anything good. <laughs>